Thank you, Becca. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this morning. I'm glad that y'all could make it. Hopefully you're joining either via Facebook Live or our invite list from Zoom. This morning, I wanted to talk a little bit about executive learning um, and how to get more learning done in less time. As executives face an increasing uh, set of demands in their lives, it becomes paramount to figure out how to be the most effective in your learning strategies. But what's the real problem underlying our need to keep learning? Well, recently I hired a new employee here on our team and we asked for a laptop for her. And what happened was they gave us a MacBook and she showed me the MacBook and it had a CD-ROM in the side. Remember those CD-ROM, uh, you know, had a little CD uh, place on the side of the, of the MacBook and you could put in the CD-ROM and I was surprised because I hadn't seen one of those in a few years. And, um, the, but the MacBook looked similar to the one that I have, only had the CD-ROM in it. And it got me thinking about how quickly things change over time, especially in technology. And on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a graph that's depicting Moore's Law. And Moore's Law says that every two years, the number of transistors that can be fit onto a microchip double. Now, why is that important? Well, it's a, actually a proxy correlation for how fast technology changes. So not only can we put more transistors on a microchip, we can also change technology quickly because of that Moore's Law. So things change really quick. I mean, think back uh, about how a few years ago we were using these BlackBerry phones. Uh, my wife and I were watching a, a new uh, TV show and, and we had been catching up on a series and it was a few years old and they're using Blackberries and I was astounded. And now we're all using some version of a smartphone with a touch screen, right? No more buttons. So it wasn't that long ago that we were on those Blackberries. It wasn't that long ago that we were on a CD-ROM and now things have completely changed just a few years later. But it's not just technology that things are changing really quickly. Think about the S&P 500, the stock market index of 500 large companies in the U.S. In 1965, a company who made the S&P 500 list could expect to stay on the list for 33 years. By 1990, a company could only expect to be on the list for 20 years. And they're predicting by 2026 that uh, it'll only be 14 years in length for people to stay on that list. And get this, over 50% of the companies on the S&P 500 list will turn over in the next 10 years. But it's not just finance, it's also demographics. In 2016, millennials overtook Generation X and baby boomers as the largest generation in the, work, in the workplace. So we have a convergence of many factors that are driving change technologically, demographically, and also economically. But it's not just generations. Look at this uh, map here. This actually is depicting uh, the percentage of people who moved um, from one city to another in their country in the last five years. So the darker the green is, the higher is the percentage of people who have moved in the last five years. So you see, for example, in the continental US, over 21% of people have moved from to another city or from another city uh, in the last five years. And similar, similar things are happening in regions of Africa and Europe. So all of this is to say, that rapid change is the new normal and the pace will likely increase. And it's not just these factors that I've mentioned, there's many others, but change seems to be accelerating. And we as leaders and executives must become adaptive master learners to thrive in the present and the future. Now, you might ask why why does being an adaptive master learner help us cope with the turbulent times we live in? Well, here's the answer from Alvin Toffler. He was a futurist and he wrote, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, 
but those that cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. So Toffler's idea here is that things change so fast that one of the biggest skills that you can have, one of the biggest assets you can have as a leader is the drive and ability to learn, unlearn, and relearn. But what skills do we actually need to accomplish that? Well, there's a few. First, let me talk a little bit about the what. At Arizona State University and the Thunderbird School of Global Management, we operate under a new learning paradigm. We are here to include more people and to provide transformative educational experiences, but we're also here to help people learn how to learn. Here's a quote from our president who's describing uh, his model of the new American University. He says, the objective of the new model is to produce not only knowledge and innovation, but also students who are adaptive master learners empowered to integrate a broad array of interrelated disciplines and adapt over their lifetimes to changing workforce demands and shifts in the global knowledge economy. So what President Crow is talking about is it's not enough just to learn specific skills like engineering skills or computer science skills or those kind of hard skills. Those are very important, but it's also important to understand how to learn and become a master learner. Why? And he goes on in this very quote to explain, because there's an ever-changing workforce and you'll need to know various different disciplines to be able to solve real-world problems. So besides the large umbrella of the what, which is we need to become master learners, what are some of the skills inside of that what? Well, inside of becoming a master learner are two main themes. First is learning to edit and curate. And second, learning to learn. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. Many years ago, there was an economist named Wilfred Pareto, and he was um, actually growing some beans in his vegetable garden, and he noticed an interesting thing. He noticed that 20% of his bean plants produced 80% of the peas, uh, and so he was interested in this, and he started studying it more, and he found out that there was a correlation in other places um, including um, in civil service and wealth distribution and other places. And he's the one who coined this idea of the 80-20 principle. The idea that 80% of the results come from 20% of the things uh, that we do or that 80% of the wealth is held by 20% of the population. And it goes on and on and on. Now, I'll leave some time for questions uh, at the end and then we can jump back in. But what I want to get across here is that the first skill we want to really cultivate if we're going to become master learners and we're going to be able to be uh, able to do more in less time is that we need to learn how to use and leverage the 80 20 principle. We need to understand that most things that we're doing, most things that we're reading, most things that we're consuming really are not that important. We just think they are. But if we step back, we might realize that we could apply this to our executive learning. So, what do I recommend? I recommend employ, employing what I call the low information diet. Uh, so utilizing the 80-20 principle, you need to think about how you might uh, cut down on all the streams of information that are coming in. Step back and ask yourself the following. Is this social media feed helping me? It's okay if you enjoy it. So if you enjoy something, that's fine but don't fool yourself into thinking that it is information that you need to educate yourself. So ask yourself, is this something that is really helping me? Do I really need to have uh, lots of apps for news? Most news is, um, is, is the junk food of information, right? So what, what news feeds are you going to limit yourself to? What social media are you going to limit yourself to and start to cut down on the amount of, media that's coming in so that you can begin to see what is really important. Now, what you also notice is that most of the things you're reading or you're listening to or you're taking in from the media 
don't really help you in the goals that you have set for yourself. So go on a low information diet and cut things down so less information is coming in and you narrow it down to only those things, and this will take some experimentation, uh, only those things that really are helping you um, advance your own personal learning goals or your own personal development goals. So cut those down. I know, for example, that oftentimes I have uh, lots and lots of podcasts that I follow and I never end up listening to half of them anyways and they're distracting. And so it's useful for me every couple months to go in and delete out and, and unsubscribe from a bunch of podcasts. It's useful for, for me to go in and delete apps off my phone because they're just distractions. It's also very useful for me every so often just to put my phone away because it's a constant source of feeding me information that I actually may or may not need and may be impeding me from actually taking steps to uh, follow through on my learning. But we need to diet toward a goal. So yes, low information diet, but what, what actually are we trying to diet for? We don't just diet to diet, we diet to lose weight or for health or for aesthetics or some other reason. Uh, so if we're gonna go on a low information diet, we need to make sure that we actually have a goal that we're going towards. I, I um, recommend using the DEA uh, sort of structure, and that is to define, eliminate, and automate. So first you're going to define what is your actual learning goal, what are you trying to accomplish, then you're going to align the media that we've talked about along with those or the courses you might take along with those goals. Then you're going to ruthless, ruthlessly eliminate everything else. So once you've defined what you want and you are starting to find the sources of information that will align with that, then you got to start cutting everything out like, like I was mentioning of getting rid of some of those podcasts, getting rid of some of those uh, apps on your phone. Maybe you're subscribing to lots of magazines that you never read or newspapers. Get rid of, get rid of those and, and cut them out and get down to the essentials. Then once you have eliminated the extraneous, you're going to automate things. Now, you're going to automate the information. Now, how might you do that? Well, let me give you a couple examples and you'll have to figure out how to apply this in your own unique situation. But for example, Every morning I have my ALXA, and I won't say it right now because it'll turn on, um, my ALXA tell me uh, the news. So it gives me some bullet points from some very specific news feeds that I trust, and it gives me a briefing. I use the second uh, emblem down is a Flipboard. It's an aggregator for different news stories. Um, and different topics, and that brings everything into one place, aggregates it together. Aggregators are great for automating things. You, could, you also might look into Blinkist. This is a, a service that does basically cliff notes of some of the best-selling nonfiction books, and it will do it in audio, or you can read it, and so that will shorten down your time. You also might use Audible to listen to full-length books or... Um, other, there's a, there is a news subscription also inside of Audible. So that way when you're commuting or you're, or you're exercising, you can be listening to books. But these are ways to automate and find ways to, uh, to make it easier to learn when you're a busy, busy person and you're going from one place to the next. So first you are defining what you want, you're eliminating everything else. And then I suggest using technology to automate this learning as much as possible. Not that it can learn for you, but rather that technology can help facilitate your learning in a more, uh, well, expeditious way so that you're focused and you're actually uh, learning those things that you want to and it's continuously updating on its own. Now, one word of caution is that if we're on a low information diet and we're automating things by cutting down the feeds, that we have of information, um, we have to make sure we still have a varied diet. If you'll remember, President Crow said in that quote about master learners, that if we want to become master learners, we have to be able to learn to learn, but also to be interdisciplinary. So if you just eat gummy bears all the time, you're going to get sick. No matter how great they taste, uh, eventually you're going to get sick, right? Now, have you ever been stuck at a dinner party where you got 
talking to the history buff or you got stuck talking to the guy who only reads business books. And after about five or 10 minutes, you really wanted to get out of there. So we don't want to become people that A, are boring, and B, it really doesn't help us um, become more flexible and dynamic leaders if we are solely reading and consuming things in certain particular areas. So be careful when you're curating and you're editing ruthlessly down these feeds of information that you add in some things that A, you might not normally put in, and B, that might be outside of your discipline. Now this helps because we need to be more diverse in our thinking for this very reason here. This quote is by Thomas Kuhn. He is the man who wrote a book called The History of Scientific Revolutions. And he coined the phrase paradigm shift. And he said, almost always the men who achieve fundamental inventions of a new paradigm have been either very young or very new to the field. So what Kuhn is really talking about here, and he was, he was examining science and he was saying, look, all the break, big breakthroughs we've had in physics and chemistry, they're often made by someone who's new to the field or someone who's very, very young. Now, The reason he argues for that is because then we're not steeped in our own traditions and we are open-minded enough to bring in new information. So if we are careful and we curate the information that we're bringing in for learning purposes and we make sure that it's varied in nature, it will help us to see things in different ways than others. Remember back to the guy that I mentioned that only reads business books. If you only read business books or you only read finance books, for example, you'll only be able to see problems through that lens. If you pull in other things, so maybe you have a hobby in, I don't know, uh, car racing or you have a hobby in um, gardening and you bring those kinds of ideas into your feeds or design or others and you put those into your feeds, you'll be able to gain an interdisciplinary perspective and bring that to bear on problems that you have. Because the goal here isn't just to learn for learning's sake, though that's really great. It's to learn to become a master learner so you can be adaptive and cope with the ever-changing world. Now, what are some tips for learning to learn? And we're going to go through a few of these here, and I'm glad to take questions at the end. First, uh, the learning scientists are finding out that our brain loves novelty. So if you're used to taking in information in one format, for example, reading, it might be good to try a different format like audiobooks because our brain loves novelty. The other thing is I've noticed, for example, that documentaries really work well for me. So I watch lots of documentaries on topics I'm interested in uh, because it helps with the novelty effect since the documentarians are great storytellers, so there's some novelty there. Once you get sort of um, habituated to one type of learning or one type of format the information is coming in, you'll want to change it up every so often. Sometimes we won't understand that we need to do this because uh, we'll habituate slowly and we don't realize that we need a new novelty effect. So what you might want to do is put on your calendar every three three or four months that it's time to change modalities and learn in a different way. So maybe you take an online class instead, or maybe you uh, do a group meetup or something like that. Change up the way that you're learning. Second, our brains work on the use it or lose it principle. So all of us have had the experience of cramming for a test in college or some other uh, certification process. And we crammed all the answers in and we did find out in the test and 15 to 20 minutes later, a lot of it's gone. So we need to practice what we're doing um, in order for us to kind of retain that information. And this connects to the last point, which is we need to fail often so that we can try to learn a new skill and that, that requires us to actually be putting it into practice. So let me give you an example of these kind of how you might do this in practice. So uh, there's one technique for learning a second language, and that is rather than just studying 
vocabulary or just doing Duolingo or whatever app you would like to use to kind of get familiar with the language, it also might be useful to start reading books or magazines or articles in the language you're trying to learn, but are written about a topic you're already interested in. So for example, um, I'm interested in uh, cultivating bonsai trees. So I might start reading in Portuguese articles about bonsai trees because it will have a novelty effect because it's something interesting that I'm interested in already. Uh, I'll be using my skills to decipher the language and then um, I'll be failing very often to have to go to my dictionary or other resources to look up words as I'm going. So that's a way to encapsulate sort of these three principles into an actual experience is that if you were learning a second language, you might, you might uh, read articles in that language that actually uh, are already about something you're interested in. So that's one way to think about using these three. Another, another couple things I wanted to mention is that, you know, I'm a digital uh, native. I love, I love digital media, but sometimes it's good just to read a book, a real one. I mean, a paperback one. Um, there's an increasing amount of research showing that we are not as effective partly because um, in our learning, rather, we're not retaining as much because we're distracted by all the things that are going on in the media around us. So, for example, if I'm trying to read on my Kindle book, I might flip over and check my email compulsively. But if I have, if I have a physical book, I might get some more deep learning done because I won't be as distracted. So sometimes analog is the answer. Sometimes it's okay to write things down in a, on a pen and paper or to look at a physical book every so often or if that's a, a great way for you to switch over. I think also that going into analog also moves us from uh, it pulls us out of this sort of need to feel like we're in work mode because most of us work using technology. So if we can sort of separate ourselves from technology for a moment and then go over and pick up a book or do some of our journaling or writing out our ideas, um, that can be very helpful in an analog format. Another principle is uh, do to be. Uh, so we want to act the part. If in that previous slide where we talked about defining what you want, aligning your learning goals, eliminating the things that you don't, uh, that don't align with that. Um, if you've identified who you'd like to be like, um, start acting like that person and start hanging out with those people. There's nothing better. Uh, there's nothing that accelerates learning more than having a great mentor. So if you can get a role model or a mentor, meet with them, Maybe even you can, I've, I've seen people who have joined like executive learning book clubs that can be very useful. It might even just be a discussion group or someone you go to lunch with every so often. What they can do, uh, especially if you have a, a trusted mentor, is they can be a further curator of important information. So rather than continually relying on taking in more information via media, sometimes the best thing to do is go talk to the humans uh, and talk to the people who have already done these things and ask them questions and find out what they know and have them teach you. And then it becomes uh, a lasting friendship, but also a way for you to see how they did things in, real, in, in the real world. Many of you may know that teaching a new skill to someone or sharing a new idea uh, help solidify it in our brains. And so go ahead and teach it and share it. That's another great advantage of having uh, a mentor is you can share new ideas or bounce new ideas off of them. And then last, make it social. Maybe you need to take a class. Maybe you need to join an online group. Maybe you need to join a meetup. But the more social you can make your learning or the topics that you want to learn, make it social, the more likely you are to, to continue in that learning environment and you'll also be more likely to retain information and to gain new perspectives. So one of the great things about um, classes, for example, online or in-person or meetups, is that there is a social shaming aspect to the learning environment. If you don't show up, uh, someone's gonna ask a question and it's usually not the teacher, it's one of your classmates saying, hey, how come you know Ted wasn't here? How come 
you know, Ben didn't show up to class and then they contact you and they pull you back into the group. This is this principle of uh, sociality has been proven over and over again in the fitness world. This is why group fitness classes are very popular right now. It's because there's a social aspect that, that brings people back over and over again on a consistent basis. And probably the number one secret to being a great master learner is consistency. And so if you can get an accountability partner or a group of accountability people, it really helps. Now, I'm almost out of time, but I wanted to end with this quote again, that why it's important to become a master learner is because what Toffler said, that the illiterate really will be those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. And so if you found some of these ideas interesting, we'd welcome you to uh, apply or find out more information about the online Master of Applied Leadership and Management, a 30-credit program offered in an online format that, goes, that covers leadership and management principles. And I would be glad to take a few questions here at the end, Becca, if you would. Thank you, Dr. Cross. That was an excellent presentation. And if anyone has any questions, please post them in the Q&A box below. I have a follow-up question personally, if you could discuss the unlearn portion of that quote. That's a good, that's a very good question. It's often very hard to unlearn things. And that's because we have habits that are hard to break. And so one thing that we talked about in a previous webinar is that um, one way to modify habits is to not actually change the habit structure, but to change the content of the habit. So for example, if my habit is to always read on the Kindle app, is there a way that I can leverage that uh, so that I'm not distracted? So maybe when I go to my Kindle app, I can make sure that everything else is closed on my phone or on my computer, the emails closed down, and that way it's using a current habit to get to where I want to be. Or you might say that you could use the ha a habit structure that already exists of getting up in the morning and checking your email to, well, I'm going to get up in the morning and I'm going to go to my computer and I'm not going to turn it on, but I'm going to read this book for 10 minutes before I check my email. So you're using a, a habit structure that already exists um, and you're putting a new, a new content like the book next to your computer in the morning uh, to help you get your new goals accomplished. Great. We have a question coming in from Anne. Do you have any good apps that you would suggest for creating new habits? So there's a number of tra trackers that you can use. Um, you can use a simple to-do list like Asana, or you might use a different one that is uh, tracking particular habits. There's one I use called Strides. I'm just looking on my phone right now to remember the name. Strides is one that I use that actually helps me track habits. Uh, there's other ones that will actually send push notifications to you after you set a goal to help remind you to actually follow through on that. That can be useful. There's a couple other apps. Um, uh, like Fitness Pal, for example, if you're into tracking your diet, that will make things public. So it has friends that will post your goals to and your sort of increments of success, and that can be helpful too. Oh, another thing I'll mention, sorry, is that uh, Audible, for example, on the, uh, as you're listening to audiobooks, it has a badging system that you'll earn badges. And as you earn badges, you can make those public also. That's another way to help develop and reinforce a habit. Mike finds he can get burnt out by just learning. Do you have any info or advice on how to add entertainment or strategic distractions to his current learning structure? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, you don't want to just learn, learn all the time. I think one of the things goes back to the idea of a, a varied diet. So uh, maybe it's switching the modalities of learning. So maybe you're watching, um, we, we do uh, a lot of documentaries on Sundays. So we save that for Sundays. You might, um, I also watch a lot of uh, regular TV shows and that's fine. You need some distraction like that. I also will find that sometimes you learn, learn a few things or make a few connections through that. But what I would say is that one thing that we need to make sure of that 
is revealed in the science is that um, our brains only have enough capacity to learn in short bursts. And so it's okay to chunk things. So put things into smaller bits and give yourself breaks in between. Our brains are meant to operate in intervals. And so it's okay to have strategic distractions. It's okay to uh, put in, I'm going to check Facebook after I get this, you know, three things done or I read this article or whatever you're saying, it's okay to give yourself rewards like that. And so it is certainly good to have those distractions. It's also important. uh, We found that exercise is really important to, to retaining more information. So if you can use exercise as a strategic distraction, that's really great too. And Michael says, great session. Thank you. And from you, Michael. Ernestina, thank you, Dr. Cross. Of course. Okay, that looks like about the end of our qu- Oh, here comes someone from Enrique. Do you have any thoughts about incorporating physical new activities to develop? Physical new activities. So um, if you're learning a skill that requires physical activity, one of the best ways to do that is to find someone to model that behavior. So for example, if you're having to learn a new skill that requires movement, um, you might go observe someone who does a similar job or similar, has a similar skill, and that could help you model that also. Great. From Yannick, what is your advice on getting the right mentorship? So that's a great question. So one of the things to do to identify mentors is, number one, cold calling doesn't work, so don't do that. Uh, number two is to make sure that you're identifying people that are in the general area that you're, you're shooting to achieve. So you're shooting for an, a, a goal of becoming, I don't know, a VP of marketing. Is there a director of marketing that you might go ahead and, and talk with? So you don't want to go too high straight to the VP of marketing if you're not already a director, if you're a manager, for example. So first, go one level above you. Uh, get to know that person and then that person can introduce you to the next level of where you really want to go. I think what happens often with mentoring is that we expect uh, them to take us from where we are to where we want to go right away. And there's often many mentors in between there that can help us. And there's often many steps that they can get us to. So as you're identifying mentors, what you want to do is identify mentors that will get you to the next step towards your goal. So If you're a manager of of marketing and you want to get to the VP, you need to make that director connection and see if they can help you get to that level in your career. And then after that, move into the VP uh, arena. So one step at a time and the mentor should match the steps that you're moving through. We have a follow-up question from Russ. What is the difference between mentor and sponsor? Well, a mentor is really uh, someone who is a role model that you're meeting with um, every so often. A sponsor usually is someone that is uh, helping you through a a specific change process or uh, modifying behavior in a way and is really working as an accountability partner and is someone who helps you uh, make sure that you're staying on track with whatever whatever system of change you are, are working through. So mentors, I would say, are uh, folks that are usually modeling or already in an area where you want to be or already sort of have a position in the workplace that you want to achieve. And a sponsor or a coach might be someone who is coaching the specific behaviors you need to get to where the role model is. From Harry, what are the keys to reflective learning? So reflective learning is an interesting concept. This is the idea that we need time to stop, think about how, how or what we've learned, and then uh, try to put it into practice. Now, the key for me is, number one, um, creating space for us to actually think about what we're learning. Sometimes we're just putting in more new information on top of new information, and we're not digesting it properly. And so but I was one thing that I rely on is journaling and journaling or summarizing, even if you want to do that, summarizing an idea by writing it out, 
um, just in a few paragraphs or some bullet points can be very helpful in the re reflective process, can help you make sense of things. And then after you have done this reflective experience of journaling, go ahead and teach it to someone else or share an idea with someone else. And that can help with that reflective process, bringing it from intake of information, reflection and digestion to then teaching someone else uh, that skill to help solidify it even more. Miriam says, great topic and discussion. Very relevant in her circle right now. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. Next question. How does the Thunderbirds online degree help with applying these skills in real life? Great question. So a couple things is uh, in our classes, we ask students to do activities in the real world. So in my class, for example, um, I asked students to take a real world uh, change uh, initiative that they're working on in the workplace and to create a strategic plan around that. Another activity is for them to go into a, a new cultural experience and then report back. So through the instruction and through the materials that we have in the online space, not only can students gain new information and make connections with each other, we also have webinars like this in some of the classes that are live for interaction. So their students are connecting with each other, but we're also asking them to take uh, problems from their workplace and apply the new skills that they're learning in the class and then report back as an assignment. From Ernestina, I find many mentors are not truly interested in talking to, taking you to the next step, but rather help them achieve their own goal. Would you suggest staying away from such individuals or can I use it as a learning opportunity? Great question. Um, the answer is it depends, but really the, what I would say is it's okay if, if the person isn't interested in taking you to the next level, you might be able to ha have, that's because they're threatened for some reason, because you might be taking uh, some of their, their thunder or sort of they're afraid that you're going to take their spot or something like that. So what you might want to do with that type of mentor is um, learn from them as much as you can and see if there is a separate but related vertical within which you can excel that they could help you. So it's not directly threatening to them. So maybe not, you know, the next, the next uh, level below them in a position, for example. But maybe there's something to the side that it might be in another department or something like that that they might help connect you with others. So yes, you can learn from those folks, but also leverage them as connectors to other mentors in different verticals uh, that you might be able to, to make more progress moving up in the workplace. Karen asks, is there an outline, so to speak, when learning to learn? So there, there, there's lots of ways to learn to learn, but the truth of the matter is that you just got to start experimenting because it's so individual. That's why I mentioned different modalities. Some people like to listen to audiobooks. Some people like to li listen to Cliff Notes versions of articles. Others don't. Uh, I learn really well when I watch documentaries. I learn really well when I listen to audiobooks. So that's helpful for me. So you want to start experimenting with that. But the truth is you have to experiment and try some different things to see what works for you. But the point is to start trying to learn. That's the first impetus of becoming a master learner is recognizing that you need to continuously learn. And then also that you need to make sure that that diet of information is varied and interdisciplinary because that's the way we solve problems. If we have a finance problem, it's almost always not just a finance problem in our organizations. There's psychology involved. There's operations management involved. There is a cultural phenomenon that is involved. And so we need to have sort of a well-rounded perspective in our learning. And so I would say those are the two main things to keep in mind. One, make sure that you are having this very diet and two, make sure that you are starting to experiment and every day trying to uh, come up with some activities that are advancing your learning. Once you find out what modalities you like, that becomes easier because then it's just, you know, you're on the way home, you're listening to these podcasts on the way on the commute to work. You're listening to these different ones, or maybe on Saturdays you have a few 
documentaries in the queue that you're going to watch, and that helps you uh, continue your learning. Roger asks, considering your comment about learning in short bursts, what would your strategy be for learning large amounts of info, but in different areas? Would you focus on one area in short bursts until you reach competency before moving to a different subject? Or would mixing subjects help to add novelty? That's a great question. So it, if, if, the, if the areas are contingent upon one another, it's often useful to go through one specific area first in short bursts until you master that area and then move on to the next area. Now, if it's just um, some material you need to get through that isn't contingent or dependent on the other area, the novelty effect would be better to move from one area to the next and to come back. So if you need to like memorize everything and have it really down in a specific area, it's often good to do what we call deep learning. So you do small chunks, but you stay in that specific area for, uh, until it's mastered. But if you are sort of just needing to understand everything, not, as, not a, at a sort of memorized level, then I would use the novelty effect and I would jump between different things and then come back. Anne asks, what classes do you teach specifically in the program? Are you able to audit or take them without joining the program or before joining the program? Sure. So uh, I teach a class called Personal Leadership and Development. Um, and I also teach another class uh, coming up here called Managing People from a Global Perspective. And I teach one more, which is the Capstone course, uh, which is uh, Communications of Business Planning or Strategic Planning. Um, you, can, you can take those courses audited. There are ways to do that. You'd need to contact Becca. Um, my course comes at the beginning of the program, and so if you join the program, you'll probably have me in, within the first two semesters of the course of the program, rather. And so um, you'll be able to sort of experiment and see there. Also, um, we have some more webinars if you'd like to watch those. Absolutely. All right, and from Marchano. Should my mentor have the skills and knowledge on the soft skills one is learning? So I think that having mentors that have the soft skills you're looking for are very, is very, very important. Um, I always say that people get hired and fired on soft skills. So yes, you have to have the technical knowledge. Yes, it's great to have mentors that have that technical knowledge. They need to be competent enough but they also need to be people who are extremely emotional, intelligent, and have soft skills to help you navigate the complex world of work or the organizational politics within which you're trying to operate. So make sure that, yes, the, that your mentor exhibits soft skills and can help teach you soft skills. Now, don't expect a mentor to sort of break it down for you. This is why I you know, communicate this way or this is why I present myself in this manner. Rather, you need to be an observer of their soft skills and then take those in. And someone mentioned the reflective learning process earlier. Go back after a mentor session or a lunch with a mentor, write down some of the interesting things that you observed or you learned, and then try to put some, a few of those into practice yourself. And we have a couple more thank yous from Ernestina and Karen. Thank you. And yes, Ernestina, I have posted my contact information in the chat box and you can find the past webinars displayed on our website under the Knowledge Network and I can send out a link to that. Also note, I will be sending out the recording as well as the slides later today. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, please reach out if we can help you. See you next month.